So is peanut butter good or is it bad? There's an assumption that things are good or bad. It's kind of a way that we look at the world. We tend to make things black or white. How much peanut butter are we actually talking about? Are we talking about a half a teaspoon per day? Or are we talking about a half a jar per day? Because those are two very different things. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Here's your host, James Jacobson. Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to start off today's show by telling you that I understand. I understand how clever a dog can be and how good some of them are at detecting hidden pills and capsules. You know, I've been stumped more times than I'd like to admit. What can I hide this pill in that my dog won't find it? Let's be honest, dogs have a keen ability to outsmart us way before we've caught on that they've done it. So what happens when we're hiding pills and things aren't working anymore? We start looking for more highly flavored, delicious, palatable things that we can find in our refrigerators or our pantries. Things like peanut butter. But should we be doing that? We'll find out in today's question and answer episode from Dr. Damian Dressler, the author of the best-selling book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, everything you wanted to know about your dog and peanut butter. Quick plug here, that book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, is the sponsor of today's podcast episode, co-authored by veterinary oncologist Sue Ettinger. The Dog Cancer Survival Guide is available wherever fine books are sold and online at dogcancerbook.com. Now let's check in with Dr. D and see what he thinks about the safety of feeding your dog peanut butter. Dr. Dressler, we have a question here and evidently a lot of people are asking it. Is peanut butter good or bad for dogs? Well, that is an interesting question because I think if you look at this question, we have to take into account the presupposition. So there's an assumption that things are good or bad. It's kind of a way that we look at the world. We tend to make things black or white. And one of the things that you realize as you kind of get into this field is that the lines between good and bad become a little bit harder to clarify. As an example, how much peanut butter are we actually talking about? Are we talking about a half a teaspoon per day or are we talking about a half a jar per day? Because those are two very different things. For example, you could look at, say, salt. We all need salt. If you don't have salt, you will eventually die. But if you eat a whole lot of salt, then you will also die. So is salt good or is it bad? It's all a question of degree and amount. And it's a little bit hard for me to give a cookie cutter recommendation on peanut butter because a lot of it's going to be dependent on the dog. Some dogs, when they take peanut butter, because of the fat content, their pancreas will get inflamed and they'll develop vomiting or diarrhea and reduced appetite. And other dogs who take peanut butter, to them, it's nothing. It's a great thing. So it's a little bit hard. So what I would do is I would say, okay, well, let's first of all make sure that you start small with the peanut butter and that would be say a half a teaspoon in a day and just make sure that there's no vomiting or diarrhea or loss of appetite or other strange reactions which would be very unusual because peanut allergies are not common in dogs but they do exist so half a teaspoon per day do that for a day then the next day you can work your way up to three quarters of a teaspoon and then maybe even go up to a teaspoon and a half. Now, some of this will also depend on the size of the dog. So if you've got a teacup breed, sort of a dog that weighs five pounds, one and a half teaspoons is going to be entirely different from a giant breed, Neapolitan Mastiff. So again, there's a question of amount. So reasonable quantities usually are not a problem consult with your veterinarian on it, make sure you don't have allergies, work your way up slowly. And in terms of final recommendation, you're going to need to discuss that with your veterinarian because it's a little bit hard to give a blanket recommendation. Now, I also imagine it depends a little bit on what the peanut butter is. I think that there are peanut butters that are flavored with xylitol, which I know is really bad. Yeah, xylitol is not a good thing to give to your dog, regardless of what food item you're feeding your animal. Obviously, in the case of cancer, we want to try to avoid carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates. So that's going to be things like corn syrup. That's going to be things like simple sugars, some peanut butters. Well, they're very tasty and sweet but they have added sugar ingredients that are not xylitol, but are legitimately carbohydrates, starches, and sugars. And since these are cancer's preferred source of fuel, they're good things to avoid. And you could even, you know, if you want to pursue this further, you could get concerned about aflatoxin, which is a mold that's found in peanuts. But again, it's kind of like, well, 
You could be concerned about your eggs giving you salmonella, so you can read about these things, but here in Western society, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, these things are tested for, and uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, the foods are safe in terms of things like molds and bacteria and other contaminants. So that does get into the food system, but that's really the exception. So if you're going to use peanut butter, a natural one, obviously just peanuts. Yeah, ground peanuts. So it's a good idea. Do dogs ever get allergies to peanuts? You said that it's rare. It's rare. Yeah, I mean, you can have allergies, all sorts of things, just like in people. Many, many, many years ago, when I first introduced the idea of using krill oil as a source of fatty acids for omega-3 fatty acids, which I discussed in the book, and this is like 20 years ago or something, I got this feedback. Somebody wrote, I'm not going to carry an EpiPen because you are suggesting that you give the dog shellfish-derived products. I was like, it's not like every dog has a shellfish allergy. So it's all a matter of the individual variation there. And again, if you were, say, a human being and you're allergic to crab and you go off and you eat a crab sandwich, well, that's bad for you. Same thing is true with dogs, but that's the minority. Like if you look at the populations involved and the numbers that are involved, it's a very small portion of dogs that are allergic to things like peanuts and shellfish or whatever particular allergen you're talking about. The subject of allergies is a complicated one. But if you look at the most common food allergens, those are going to be beef, soy, dairy, wheat, corn, and chicken. And lamb is starting to become one and rice is starting to become one. But those are your most common dietary allergens. Reactions to things that are different from that are quite uncommon, but do very rarely happen just as they do in people. So I know that some people asked us about using peanut butter as a way to sort of hide the pills. What do you think? Yeah, well, again, it's a matter of amount and it's a matter of tolerance. Some dogs can eat whatever and they're fine. Right. And some dogs, if they have a simple dietary change from one high quality good food to another high quality good food, they'll end up bleeding rectally with hemorrhagic gastroenteritis and in critical shape with low blood pressure and in need of intensive care. So the recommendation, if you want to use peanut butter, start slowly and under veterinary supervision, do a little tolerance test first to get an idea of, can my dog tolerate fats? Does my dog have any suspected dietary allergens? Take your animal's individual needs into account first and then, you know, you can proceed. The other thing what I usually tell people as far as administration of tablets, pills and things, meatballs often work as well. You can do ground meats that are seasoned, again, avoiding really high fat. If your dog doesn't have a beef allergy, beef hamburger balls work just fine. You can stick the pill inside the meatball or you can use turkey, lamb, bison, ostrich. A lot of these protein sources come in ground form and you can cook and freeze the little balls and then defrost them and pop the pill in when it's soft enough and you can defrost them little by little so they don't go bad in your refrigerator because say you make a month's worth of little meatballs take them out little by little or freeze them in small packages so that you can use them uh, and defrost them gradually without them spoiling that sounds like a very tasty natural pill pocket yeah it's quite good dr dressler thank you so much for being with us today you're welcome so there you have it. Peanut butter is safe for dogs. As long as you take the necessary precautions and consult with your veterinarian before giving it to your dog, especially if your dog has cancer. To access the show notes from today's episode or to listen to any of our previous episodes, you can check them out at our website at dogcanceranswers.com or you can connect with us on social media. Now, if you haven't subscribed to the newsletter, Dog Cancer News, you should. The newsletter is written by the editorial team of dog lovers at Dog Cancer Blog, and they happen to be one of the sponsors of this week's show. As a subscriber to the newsletter, Dog Cancer News, you can get access to tips and recipes and new developments in dog cancer. And the best part, the newsletter is completely complimentary, free, zero, cost, zilch, no cost, totally free. Here's how to sign up. Just go to dogcancernews.com. Those touch tones remind me that we have veterinarians on call at Dog Cancer Answers on our listener line. If you have questions for one of our dog cancer vets, 
give us a call and tell us about it. We'll make sure that your question is addressed with one of our veterinary experts, and it just might appear on a future episode of Dog Cancer Answers. The telephone number to call is 808-868-3200. That is available 24 hours, 7 days a week, 808-868-3200. Or you can visit us at our website at dogcanceranswers.com. Well, that does it for today's Q&A episode. I'm James Jacobson. And from all of us here at Dog Cancer Answers and Dog Podcast Network, I wish you and your dog a warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.